former City College student is faced with deportation. We have the story on how a professor is helping to fight her stay. And three San Diego colleges join a nationwide protest. Find out how they're standing up for higher education. Plus, in Ohio, students at Shorten High School return to class for the first time since this week's deadly shooting. We have the 911 calls made when the gunman opened fire. And will this warm weather stick around for this weekend? I'll let you know. Musing starts right now. Hello and welcome to this edition of News in Emmanuel Sanfo. And I'm Annette Chacon. Thank you for joining us. We have Adriana Carlos in the Weather Center with a quick weather update on what's going on in the Midwest. Adriana? Yes, we're looking at, at severe weather uh, along the Midwest, but let's take a look at all the destruction that's going on in there. A pre-drawn twister flattened entire blocks of homes in a small Illinois town Wednesday as violent storms linger throughout the Midwest and South, killing at least 12 people in three states. The tornado blasted Harrisburg in southern Illinois, which was ranked as the second highest given to twisters based on damage. Scientists state that it was 200 yards wide with winds up to 170 miles per hour. But we'll have more of this update on my weather forecast. Thank you. Up to you in the desk. Thank you for that. Yesterday, City College student protesters joined Occupy College protesters across the nation in a classroom walkout. Around 200 students left classes to protest enrollment fees and cuts to the school's budgets. Budget cuts really are having a drastic effect on what is still education. I won't really call it education for too much longer if these budget cuts keep occurring. So there's a historical basis for walkouts, and the civil rights movement really illustrates that, and that's why we, we decide to take these kind, of these kind of tactics, to show opposition to budget cuts and to try to save our education. The national walkout, they're set to, to be um, across the nation, and I've heard even reports of saying that students in England and students in different parts of, of the world are trying to do the same. The next major student protest is scheduled for May 1st to coincide with May Day, a yearly celebration of workers' rights. And an effort's underway to help City College student who is facing major league challenges, Marlene Garcia is brought to the United States illegally by her parents from Mexico and now faces a deportation. Kim Scott is here to tell us the latest on that story. Now, Kim. Thank you, Manny and Annette. 23-year-old Marlene Garcia wants to be a radiologist, but all her plans are on hold as she fights to remain in the United States. It all started with a night out at a restaurant in San Diego and ended with her being arrested and detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I got nervous and I didn't know what to do. And they asked us, for our documents, so we we didn't show nothing. And these are the painful <laughs> memories Marlene recounts following her arrest on August 13, 2011. I couldn't take a bath. I couldn't change clothes. I couldn't do nothing. Marlene, along with 12 other detainees, was shipped to a Las Vegas detention center where a judge released her with a continuance hearing scheduled for October 2012. She is hoping to raise enough money by then in order to hire a lawyer. Professor Enrique Davalos, a Chicano studies teacher and known activist, is helping Marlene fight her case. Through the years, uh, pretty much I, I, I became sort of like a paralegal, no, trying to to help them, uh, uh, at least to advise. Officials here at the U.S. Immigration Office will not give a specific details about Garcia's case, but they do say that there is possible legislation pending that will allow undocumented immigrants such as Marlene to stay in the country and waive their deportation. So far, Mr. Davalos has helped raise $1,000 to help Marlene's cause. To contribute, you can contact him at edavalos at sdccd.edu. Manny and Annette, I'll continue to follow Marlene's progress and give you guys updates as the story unfolds. Thank you for that, Kima. 
New details are unfolding about the deadly high school shooting that took place in Ohio Monday. Students returned to school this morning after teen boys shot and killed three students at Chardon High School. Authorities released a series of 911 calls detailing the horror inside the school as the gunmen opened fire in the cafeteria. Hey, this is uh, Principal Chardon again. Yeah, hey, um, the alleged shooter ran out the back door down the, uh, the easement towards the tennis courts past the pool. Officials say 17-year-old T.J. Lane confessed to the shootings and chose his victims at random. Lane has been charged with three counts of aggravated murder. Prosecutors say he still has a chance to be tried as an adult. He's expected back in court March 19th. And earlier this week, three firefighters were arrested on suspicion of brutally attacking two brothers in Normal Heights. Captain Vadid Cisneros, Firefighter Andrew Burnin, and Firefighter Gregory Ikani are all being held on serious charges. Now, the incident occurred following an exchange of words near the intersection of Adams Avenue and 34th Street at 2 a.m. on Sunday. The suspects attacked the brothers by kicking and punching them. One brother was seriously injured, badly enough to be rushed to the hospital. No discipl disciplinary charges have been filed by the fire department, and all three firefighters are scheduled to return to work this Friday. A man suspected of killing two women appeared in a Torrance courtroom today. 23-year-old Jonathan Chacon was detained by Mexican authorities at a hotel in Rosarita Beach Wednesday morning. He was arrested after the bodies of his 19-year-old girlfriend Courtney Bergman and her 59-year-old mother were found at the Redondo Beach home. These are the second and third killings in a Redondo Beach in less than a week. Sidewalks are considered public property. You can sit, stand, or even protest if you'd like, but there's one thing you can do in the sidewalks of San Marcos. Jobet Vera tells us more. For some passerbys, it's pure entertainment. For others, it's a safety hazard. And others see it as a nuisance. Either way, you can't do this in San Marcos anymore. Jonathan Hamilton used to hold a sign, but now that sign spinning is banned in San Marcos, all you will see him doing is this, waving and smiling to cars passing by. You know, there's uh, different dynamics, I guess, to interacting with the people in the street when you're holding a sign and when you're just waving. Since the law has been placed here in San Marcos, companies such as Liberty Tax has seen an impact in business. Uh, we've been down uh, just from 15% uh, from what the sign waivers usually bring in. So if sign spinners help to bring in business, why would the city ban them in the first place? Jenny Peterson, communications manager of San Marcos, tells us why. It is a distraction to drivers and we want to try and eliminate that where we can. We brought it back to San Diego and asked local companies how they'd feel if that same law was enforced here. I think that it's just a restriction that would affect many, many businesses and, and that are trying to get established. Despite the new ban, people are still able to exercise their freedom of speech on sidewalks, as long as they don't advertise a business with a sign. With photojournalist Jackie Beltran, I'm Joe Bathdevera, New Scene. The new law follows a long list of cities across the U.S. trying to keep commercial advertisements off their public sidewalks. And coming up after the break, two major refineries have temporarily shut down. We'll tell you how this is affecting gas prices. But it wouldn't be safe to keep your distance until the secret's out. Keep smile. Why the sources 